Thank you very much. Extraordinary indeed. I'm delighted to be speaking with such an esteemed panel. And I'm delighted to be speaking about the Ram Charit uh, Manas. Uh, the uh, conversation is topical for many reasons. Bhagwan Ram has been in the news because of uh, the Pran Pratishta in Ayodhya. This is the 450th, 2024 is the 450th birthday of Ram Charit Manas. And more immediately, uh, the multi, uh, multi classical libraries translation project of the Ram Charit Manas in seven volumes from the Avdi to English done by the wonderful Philip Lutkendorf is finally complete. But on a more personal note, um, the Ram Charit Manas and the language in which it is written, Avdi, are uh, very special to me. Uh, Avdi is my mother tongue, my father tongue, if you will. I, my father's family is from a village near Ayodhya. And uh, it's one of the first languages I heard. It's a language of emotion uh, for me. Um, and uh, uh, the Ram Charit Manas is not uh, simply a religious text in our parts. It's uh, almost everybody, even if they've never been to school, that I know um, from uh, my family and my family friends can recite it by heart. And uh, they quote and misquote it on uh, any occasion. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, my father, for example, uh, was prone to whenever we had an unwanted guest say, Avat ek dusaha dukh dehi, bichurat ek pran hari lehi. That is not the context in which Tulsi Das wrote it. Uh, but it never failed to make me uh, laugh and to uh, giggle. So this personal connection makes this conversation even more special. I'd like to begin the conversation by congratulating Philip. What a mammoth task and done so well. Congratulations, Philip. But when I was preparing for the session, what, as somebody who's lived with Ram Charit Manas all her life, I, was, I couldn't help but wonder, you came across the Rama and the Ram Charit Manas uh, in the 70s, and then you researched the cultural context, wrote about it, and then took on this translation project that's gone on for years. What has kept you hooked to um, uh, the Ram Charit Manas? Okay. Well, um, I first came to India in 1971. And by the way, this is a bilingual session, no? लेकिन मैं ज्यादातर अंग्रेजी में बोलूंगा क्योंकि काफी लोग हैं यहाँ पर जो हिंदी नहीं समझते तो और लेकिन हिंदी भी हो सकता है हो सकती है यहाँ पर तो I came in '71 as a young you know explorer tourist and fell in love with North India and of course immediately you start hearing about Ramayan and in North India Ramayan means Goswami Tulsidas uh, Ramcharit Manas uh, it wasn't until quite a few years later that I had learned enough Hindi that I could start reading it. I did that at the University of Chicago starting in 1980. And wonderfully, the teacher that I had there um, in, in, insisted that I chant, uh, that we read it aloud, which was very important for me. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, and as you, as, as was said in the introduction, I ended up doing my dissertation on the performance traditions. It became a book called The Life of a Text. Uh, I lived in Banaras, visited Ayodhya, Chitrakut, other places. Um, and that led to a book on Hanuman. I never thought about translating the Manas. I'll just make this really quick. When A.K. Ramanujan, who was one of my gurus, at Chicago, when he passed away so suddenly and unexpectedly, um, I made an attempt at translating one section, Sundarkand. Um, I did a, you know, 60, 60 stanzas, um, and sort of trying to channel Raman in a way, try, trying to be a different kind of translator than I had ever been. But that was my first stab at it. And then the Murti series people approached me in 2009, I think, asking for a new English translation. I said, why? There are so many. But they said, do you like them? I said, well, no. Um, so anyway, I took it on. And barasal ke baad ho, ho gaya. <laughs> the rest is this is <laughs> history. Um, uh, Harish, uh, coming to you, I wanted to, uh, for you to quickly just contextualize the um, times in which the Ramcharit Manas was written. 
Um, there was uh, Akbar on the throne, there was uh, Mughal rulers had established themselves, there were foreign religions amongst our myths, the Bhakti and Sufi traditions had also begun to come up in a very significant way and there was perhaps a need felt that our scriptures, our uh, epics uh, need to be taken out of the purview of um, one dominant caste because of the language in which they tend to be, which is Sanskrit, and make it more widely accessible. How does this context um, inform our understanding of the Ramcharit Manas? Thank you, Pragya. And the first thing I wish to do is to congratulate Philip on a wonderful job, well done. It's a marathon, translating the whole of the Ramcharit Manas. <laughs> And Philip and I go back a long time. I mean, I remember in 1998 or 1999, um, he came up, he drove up to Chicago where I was teaching to uh, let's have a power breakfast, as they say in America. <laughs> and then I walked him to the car park and uh, we could not be separated. We were talking about the Ramayana all the time. And uh, then he had to go, he remembered he had to go and get into his car and drive away. So I said to him, Hari Ananta, Hari Katha Ananta, a conversation about drama is endless. And immediately he said, Kaha hi sunahi bahubhidi sabasanta. <laughs> so that is the kind of dialogue that's been going on between us. And I am not only very happy, I'm proud of uh, Philip for having done this. And while I'm talking about it, let me also pay him a little compliment about the translation. His translation is lucid, it's elegant, it reads very well, it gathers up many of the nuances of the text. Obviously something is not carried through in translation, let's not call it lost. But a lot of it is. The wonderful thing is that so much of it gets across in a different language which has a different cultural matrix. And that I think is wonderfully well done. I'll also compliment uh, Philip for being an old-fashioned translator, and I say that in a good sense, some of the new translators presume sometimes that they are better than the original writer. They try and improve on the original. They try and rewrite the original. The translators are coming into their own these days, and it's a good thing, but not entirely a good thing if they exceed certain limits. So Philip, I'm delighted to say, does not ever attempt to do that. His reverence for Tulsidas and his poem is next to none. So he is an ideal translator of such a long and wonderful epic. As about the context, the historical and cultural context that you wanted me to speak about, <coughs> you know, there is a simplistic way of understanding history, and the British taught us that, which is, that everything that happens in a particular historical period can be ascribed to the emperor, to the ruler, the Victorian age, the Elizabethan age, you know, all that, this mindset was given to us by the British. We did not have that. Our sense of history does not think that culture and literature and many of the other things in life are governed at all by the ruler. Sometimes they are independent of the ruler, sometimes they are in opposition to the ruler. There's a healthy spirit that we have maintained all through the ages. So there's no one-on-one -on -one equation here. Yes, there are a number of people who would say it was written during Mughal times, and in terms of chronology, indeed it was. But what were the Mughal times? Akbar was on the throne for about 50 years, and that was the period in which Dulsi Das flourished. They never met. He never mentions Akbar. There is a tradition in Sufi poetry, Muslim poetry, Persian poetry, <clears throat> that you begin by praising the Lord, God, then you praise the ruler of the day. No, then you praise Hazrat Muhammad, the Paigambar, and then the ruler of the day. And even Jayasi does that in Padmavat. But not Hindi poets. There's no mention of who is ruling and what kind of rule it is. The more important cultural context, the vital context for Ramcharit Manas is that it's not for the first time the Ramayana, the story of the Ramayana comes down from Valmiki to a local language understood by the democratic millions. 
is not confined to the pandits alone. And Tulsidas enacts this transition in a wonderful way, which is in each of the seven kand, the cantos, he begins with a few verses in Sanskrit. Varnanam yeah. Sanghanam, Rasanam Chandasamapi, Mangalanam Chakartaru, Vande Vani Vinayako. That's how it opens, the Ramcharitmanas. And after a few Sanskrit shlokas, he then slides into Avadhi, the language that you and I speak. I was born speaking Avadhi. I still speak in Avadhi with my siblings, a form of Avadhi uh, near Kanpur and now. Baswadi. So, this is the great cultural breakthrough that Tulsi is achieving here. He is making it available to everyone, and even then people are illiterate. Lots of people even are illiterate then, even in Avadhi. They know Avadhi, they understand Avadhi, they live in Avadhi, but they can't read. And therefore, from time to time, Tulsi Das would say, anybody who recites this book, will earn great punya. Anybody who listens to this book will earn great punya. That's the great cultural context. And I think one other thing that needs to be said is, how can you ignore a political, historical reality which determines many of the, many of the factors governing your own life? Tulsidas has very little reference to that. There are two signs that there is a Muslim rule, Mughal rule. One is that he uses about 100 words of Arabic and Persian on the whole. He is very fond of the word bag. We have kanan, we have upavan, we have van. It's not that we lack that word. But he's very fond of bag. Ban bag, koop, talag, sarita, adhik sab sovit bane. Time and again he goes to Bag. He loves it. There's something called Char Bag here. <laughs> Any Bag is good enough for him. And the other thing, the other word that struck me was Ruk. Kaikei ne dasharat ka Ruk paakar var mangi. Whether he is inclined kindly, generously or not, ask it at an opportune time. So that's one indication that Tulsidas is living at a time when there is a cultural input of a huge kind from other sources from outside India. The other thing is a very, very small indicator. He says, I don't care what people think of me. They may think I'm not a Brahmin, all right. They may think I'm a Rajput, they may think I'm a Julaha, fine by me. I've gone beyond all this. तुलसीदास की महानता इस बात में है कि ठीक है हो रहा है काफी कुछ लेकिन मेरा मन तो अपना है मैं जो मानूंगा जो चाहूंगा वो मानूंगा सो दैट्स हाउ आई सी द कल्चरल कॉन्टेक्स्ट थैंक यू फॉर दैट हरीश तुलसीदास तुलसीदास ने अपना काफ़ी वक्त बनारस में भी गुजारा था लेकिन अधिकांश जब वो रामचरितमानस की रचना कर रहे थे वो अयोध्या में थे अयोध्या में क्या कुछ चिन्ह अभी भी मिलते हैं तुलसीदास के और उनकी चरित्र के बारे में अगर हमें और जानना हो क्योंकि उन्होंने अपने मेमोआज तो लिखे नहीं थे तो हमें अयोध्या में क्या क्लूज मिल सकते हैं जितनी बातें पता है अयोध्या के कंटेक्स में उसमें एक बात यह है कि ऐसा कहा जाता है कि शुरुआत के तीन कांड लिखकर तुलसीदास जी काशी गए आज क्या मिलता है तो एक वो एक स्थान जहाँ पर ये मान्यता है कि तुलसीदास ने यहाँ रामचरितमानस लिखने की शुरुआत की वो स्थान तुलसी चौरा के नाम से मौजूद है और उसको आ, करीब तीस साल हो रहे हैं तुलसी स्मारक केंद्र के नाम से यूपी गवर्नमेंट ने एक रिसर्च सेंटर बनाया हुआ है और बहुत बड़ा अब वो बहुत बड़ा सेंटर हो गया है वहाँ पर दुनिया भर के लोग आते हैं तमाम सारे रिसर्च वर्क होते हैं फेलोशिप्स दी जाती हैं और वो इंडिजिनस स्टडी का ही एक बड़ा पार्ट है गवर्नमेंट के लेवल पर होता है 
तुलसीदास जी की एक मूर्ति लगी है एक मज़ेदार बात यह है कि जब ब्रिटिश रूल था तो वहाँ एक बहुत सुंदर एक बाग जैसा आप कह रहे हैं एक गार्डन होता था विक्टोरिया गार्डन और क्योंकि क्वीन विक्टोरिया की मूर्ति लगी थी आज़ादी के बाद ये हुआ कि साहब क्वीन विक्टोरिया यहाँ क्यों हो तो क्वीन विक्टोरिया हटा दी गई और तुलसीदास जी की प्रतिमा लगा दी गई और उसका नाम हो गया तुलसी उद्यान तो अभी पुराने लोग उसको विक्टोरिया बाग कहते हैं विक्टोरिया पार्क कहते हैं अयोध्या में और हम लोग ने जब जन्म लिया तो तुलसीदास जी को वहाँ देखा तो ये दो चीज़ें तो हैं जो आपको उस तरह से किसी इस स्थान के संदर्भ में दिखती हैं कि यहाँ तुलसीदास जी रहे मतलब एक तो मूर्ति लगाई गई और एक जगह जहाँ उन्होंने लिखना शुरू किया लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि जो टैंजिबल और इंटैंजिबल के बीच का जो एक मिसिंग लिंक होता है तुलसीदास वहाँ पर हैं अयोध्या में रामलीला में हैं वहाँ के फोकलोर में हैं वहाँ की मान्यताओं में हैं वहाँ जो रिचुअल्स होते हैं उसमें हैं बहुत सारी चीज़ें हैं बहुत बातें हैं कहने की जो भी प्रसंग है मानस में जिस तरह के मार्मिक प्रसंग मानस में आते हैं अयोध्या अवधवासियों ने उसका तर्जुमा अपने ढंग से करके गाना गा लिया है पुरते निक्सी रघुवीर वधु जब वनगमन हो रहा है गाया जाता है हमारे यहाँ अवध में रघुवर संजाप हम न अवध म रह जो रघुवर फल फूल खई हैं फोकली बिन खाब हम न अवध म रह सीता जी कह रही हैं कि अगर वो फल फूल खाएंगे तो मैं उसका छिलका खा लूँगी लेकिन मैं अवध में नहीं रहूँगी जो रघुबर तृण बिछई हैं भूमि परिजाप हम न अवध में रह अगर वो तिनका बिछा करके चटाई बिछा करके जमीन पर सोएंगे तो मैं वैसे ही पड़ी रहूँगी भूमि पर लेकिन मैं अवध में नहीं रहूँगी तो ऐसे तमाम दृष्टांत हैं जहाँ तुलसीदास की सिमिलैरिटी को फोक सॉन्ग में कन्वर्ट कर दिया गया है बाकी परंपराएं हैं बहुत सारे रिचुअल होते हैं बहुत सारे पर्व बनते हैं तो उसमें तुलसीदास पूरी तरह से समाहित हैं सबसे बड़ी परंपरा रामलीला की है और रामलीला जब शुरू हुई तो ये कहा जाता है कि मानस का बखान करने के लिए उसे जन स्वीकार्य बनाने के लिए तुलसीदास ने लीला शुरू की अयोध्या में एक मज़ेदार बात यह है हर कल्चर में हर चीज़ में मिलावट होती रहती है वो पंडित भीमसेन जोशी कहते थे कि खाने के मतलब अगर कोई राग है तो बिना मिलावट के वो पूरा नहीं होगा क्योंकि 24 कैरेट गोल्ड का गहना नहीं बनता उसमें खोट मिलानी पड़ती है तो रामलीला का भी यही प्रसंग है शुरू हुई तुलसीदास से उसमें राधे श्याम रामायण बरेली वाले उनका टैक्स आ गया न्यू एल्फर थिएटर का कुछ नुआंसेज उसमें आ गए एक बक्सर के श्रीमन नारायण भक्तमाली जी होते थे उनके पद और सवैये जो बहुत ही कोलक्ल लैंग्वेज में है और जिसमें थोड़ा उर्दू मिलती है और थोड़ा अवधि का मामला है उनके प्रसंग आ गए एक करुणा सिंधु जी महाराज होते थे वहाँ एक बहुत बड़ा संप्रदाय है जानकी घाट मंदिर का उन्होंने पहली प्रामाणिक टीका लिखी रामचरित की रामानंद लहरी तो उनके बहुत सारे नुआंसेज उसमें आते हैं तो तुलसीदास मूल में तो हैं लेकिन आज जो आप रामलीला अयोध्या में देखते हैं हम उसको सीधे नहीं कह सकते कि ये बिल्कुल प्योर रामचरितमानस है उसमें रा, राधेश्याम रामायण है उसमें भक्तमाली जी हैं उसमें करुणा सिंधु जी हैं उसमें अयोध्या के लोकल राम रसिक भक्ति परंपरा के जो संत हैं कृपा निवास जी अग्रदास जी युगलानंद शरण जी राम प्रिया जी ये सारे लोगों की कुछ कुछ बानियाँ आती लेकिन सब तुलसीदास को इज्जत करते हैं उनको याद करते हैं और एक बड़ा एक उत्सव होता है मणि पर्वत का झूला सावन जब शुरू होता है फिलिप हाँ कर रहे हैं इसका मतलब इन्होंने देखा है आ, सावन में पंद्रह दिन भगवान का झूलनोत्सव होता है झूलन क्या है जैसे वृंदावन में नाथ द्वारा में होता है मधुरोपासना में भगवान को झूला झुलाने की परंपरा है पहला दिन जो श्रावण मधुश्रवा का दिन होता है श्रावण तीज शुक्ल पक्ष तीज का दिन तो सारे मंदिरों के भगवान और किसी ने अगर अपने ठाकुर जी अपने घर में भी विराजे हुए हैं तो एक मणि पर्वत जगह है वहाँ ले जाकर झूला झुलाते हैं करीब छः हजार मंदिरों के रामलला वहाँ झूला झूलते हैं परंपरा यह है कि कनक भवन की पालकी जो कनक बिहारी हैं ऋषभान कोरी की राम जी वो सबसे आखिरी में पहुँचती है जब आखिरी में पहुंचती है तो फेस्टिवल शुरू होता है और जैसे वो पालकी उठती है फेस्टिवल समाप्त हो जाता है चार पाँच घंटे रहता है उसका संदर्भ में इसलिए ला रहा हूँ कि हर जगह जहाँ भी झूलन हो रहा होता है मणि पर्वत में मानस से फुलवारी प्रसंग के पद गाए जाते हैं ये परंपरा में है इस परंपरा को आज तक 
जितने भी सालों से 200-300 सालों से हो रही होगी किसी ने नहीं तोड़ा मैं बहुत साल गया देखने और मैंने कभी गवैयों से और वहाँ के कथावाचकों से मंदिर के पुजारियों से कहा आप कविता वाली गा दो दोहा वाली गा दो आप इसमें से कुछ विनय पत्र का आज बच्चा ना गाई आज तो फुलवारी प्रसंग गाई मतलब वो ट्रेडिशन मेंटेन है कि उस दिन सिर्फ गोस्वामी तुलसीदास होते हैं और सिर्फ फुलवारी प्रसंग होता है जो सीता जी का गिरवराज किशोरी के पूजा का प्रसंग है उसी में पूरा झूलनोत्सव होता है तो इस तरह से छोटे छोटे सभ्यता के इन पर्वों में गोस्वामी जी मौजूद हैं यू नो दिस इज सच अ ब्यूटीफुल थिंग दैट यू सेड हम जब हम लोग बड़े हो रहे थे तो हमने मानस पढ़ी तो नहीं थी जो कंठस्थ था जो लोगों से सुनी थी उसी को मानस मान लेते थे बहुत अरसे बाद जब मैंने जाकर मानस पढ़ी तो मुझे पता चला कि कितनी मिलावट हो चुकी थी और कितनी सारी ऐसी चीज़ें जो मैं जानती थी अयोध्या से जो मैंने वहाँ सुनी थी वो मानस से वो मानस में तो नहीं थी लेकिन वो मानस से इंस्पायर्ड थी उनका एक अम्बलिकल कॉर्ड मानस तक जाता था बट यू नो इट इट्स स्टिल अ मैमथ एपिक लाइक आई सेट बिफोर एंड आई वुड इन टायर ऑफ सेंग बट यू नो ट्रांसलेशन एट द बेस्ट ऑफ टाइम्स फिलिप इज अ वेरी वेरी ट्रिकी थिंग टू टेक ऑन especially when you're translating somebody like tulsi das who is not your you know your contemporary he lived in a time that might be difficult for you to fathom to understand and therefore his influences um but uh, there are particular things about the manas that make it even more challenging first of all avdi avdi is a dialect of hindi harish talked about influences from persian sanskrit and so on it is not a codified language there is no thesaurus there is no dictionary that you can refer to and say well this is my authority on what i have done it is a performative text uh, for for uh, political reasons and cultural reasons it's a, it's a performative text uh, it's actually meant to be recited there is a lay there is a lehza in which you say it without which without that ras it's meaningless um, then uh, of course you've talked about this before that in a in a in in the manas there are at least a dozen if not more words used for just lotus and english has just the one Twenty uh, one. Uh, what is so? I'm I'm curious about what were the challenges. I mean, one could draw up a long list of challenges. What were the ones that you fi- found hardest to meet, and um, how did you find your ways around it? Thank you. Well, uh, the asymmetry of lexicon, which you you just pointed out. Um, There are, I believe, uh, I give the numbers in the introduction, but I think there are 12 or more words for beautiful and lovely. And you, know, you can use beautiful, you can use lovely, but there's not a whole lot of other choices in English. Um, so I had to deal with that. Um, you, you spoke of a lack of dictionaries, but luckily there are some dictionaries. There's a three volume dictionary of bhakti that was uh, created not too long ago by some scholars and that's very helpful there's of course the uh, tulsi shabd kosh um which is particularly tulsi sahitya um so i had i had help <laughs> and of course the tikas i i used the tikas but um i think very important for me was the fact that i spent a couple of years with ramayanis and uh, kathavachaks and and manas premis and singers gane wale um and the ramlila folks um so i had uh, really a living example and that's what the first book life of a text came out of it was it was really a, it it seeks to answer the question how did a, a literary epic become so popular in an area in which at that time probably 1% of the population was literate you know how did people learn this how did so many people become what they call kantast having it in the throat meaning memorization um and uh, so that's you know that, that all that sort of informed my translation and i always um chanted as i translated not because i had any illusions that i was going to somehow capture the intoxicating rhythm or meter or rhyme i didn't try at all to do that 
there are two rhyming verse translations of the Manas, and I think they're both unreadable, personally. Um, but, um, but just because it was important to me to hear the verse over again, over and over again, as I thought about it, and as I thought about it, and I really appreciate, Heishti, what you said, that I'm old-fashioned. Uh, I, ta I do take that very much as a compliment. <laughs> and, and by the way, speaking of uh, Perso Arabic, don't forget that he calls Ram Sahab repeatedly, and Garib, Garib and the Wads. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, of course, uh, uh, the Manas is the bedrock of Bhakti, uh, of Ram Bhakti, um, across North India, very much so in Avad. But it's also a, a Mahakavya. It is also a book of exquisite poetry. It is also a book of philosophy. Uh, when we think of Hindu philosophy, perhaps Manas is not the first thing that comes to mind, but I would, uh, I would argue that there is a lot of philosophy in it. And in fact, um, quite inappropriately, a lot of times it's reductively the Rama and the Ra Ramjarit Manas is referred to as a moral tale. But uh, the concept of good and evil, if you read the Manas, is um, uh, fairly intertwined and that leads us to philosophy. Harish, um, on your reading of the Manas as a poetic and a philosophical text, also perhaps because we are short on time, perhaps Ramanujan was invoked at the beginning of this, uh, of this session and he's of course written the essay 300 Ramayan. So addressing that, there are so many Ramayans across the country and so many nuances. The story differs from Valmik, Valmiki's Ramayan in this one. What is the reading of this, a comparative reading of this, tell us? Yeah, you know, among those who speak English and read English, and perhaps English only, uh, Ramanujan's uh, quip that there are 300 Ramayanas has become very popular and uh, sometimes been used as a kind of weapon against Tulsidas to mean that his is not the only Ramayana, there are endless Ramayanas and he should not be particularly privileged. Well, fine, but what did Tulsidas say? Tulsidas also had something to say about how many Ramayanas there are in the world. And he said, Ramayana shat koti apara. There are 100 crore Ramayanas. And the number of Ramayanas is absolutely endless apar. And he said that 400 years before Ramanujan. The plurality of Ramayanas has always been there from before Tulsidas to after Tulsidas. And what he seems to imply is there are as many Ramayanas as there are people reading it in any version at all. Everyone makes their own Ramayana. As about the poetry, yes, you know, Lots of people don't know this, perhaps those who uh, do not have much to do with the Hindi departments and the South Asian departments in uh, the West, Ramayana is read as a literary text, not as a bhakti text, which you read a few pages of after you baste and put on fresh clothes. No. You read it in the classroom. And there are many, many scholars who have added to the interpretation, the exegesis, or what it is that makes it a great Mahakavya, a great epic. Um, what I might do is two or three kinds of poetry that come up and we're all pleased with, we're all impressed by, without quite figuring out how, they, how the poetic effect comes about. You were talking about lotus. So every part of Ramachandra, from his face to his feet, is like a lotus. What does the effect of the line depend on? The repeated simile. Kanja used so many times, so that it becomes a kind of a mantra. It begins to entrance us, that repetition. And that's a very important part of poetry and the poetic effect. Uh, similar effect, the use of Persian that I mentioned, Rama Garib Nevaju Baneho Garib Nevaju Garib Nevaju. Three times he calls in one line, he calls Ram Garib Nevaz, and some people think in our ignorance that Garib Nevaz lives only in Ajmer and is a Muslim. No. 
Tulsidas open heartedly, liberally is calling Ram Garib Nivas repeatedly. So there is, when we talk about syncretism, when we talk about synthesis, when we talk about tolerance, it does not all lie in one corner. It's very widespread. About poetry, one small example that I wish to present before you. Uh, it occurs when poetry is not expected. That's one of the great things about poetry. It can spring up anywhere in great poets. Ram has just crossed over to Sri Lanka. That setu, that bridge has been built and he with his ragbag army of uh, bears and monkeys has crossed over. He has camped on top of a small hill, Subela Parvat, and Lakshman has made a rough and ready bed for him on which he lies this evening. Tomorrow morning, battle will commence. He should be worrying about the battle, how to win against a mighty enemy. But what, what, does, his, what does his mind fly to? He's lying there looking up at the sky. Purabhadisabiloki Prabhu, Dekha Udit Mayank, Kaho Sabahi, Dekha Sasi, Mrigapati Saris Asang. It's an amazing line in that context. He's not thinking about war. He looks to the east and finds that the moon has risen. And he says to everybody, look, look, the moon. The moon looks like dot, dot, dot. What do you think Ram said the moon looks like? There have been thousands and perhaps, I don't know, <laughs> hundreds of thousands and perhaps millions of images for the moon in all the languages of the world. But this is new. He says the moon looks like a lion who is fearless and dauntless. Ashank, jisko koi shanka nahi hai, apne singh hoonne ke baare mein. So he's admiring the moon in the sky, but the subconscious is still occupied with valor, with bravery, with uh, his own uh, victory to come. And then in play, he says, all right, everyone around me, what do you think is that black spot in the moon? And everybody is invited to give their own explanations. It's like a Kavi Sammelan. And so grief says, it is the shadow of the earth falling on the moon. Somebody else says, and Tulsi does not say who, he just says, koi aur. Somebody else says that when Rahu attacked the moon, it inflicted a wound so deep that the scar is still black. And the third person says, when God created Rati, the most beautiful woman in the world. Why is Rati the most beautiful woman in the world? Because she is the wife of Kamadeva and therefore has to be equally attractive. Then God plucked out a spot from the center of the moon with which to make her face, Chandramukhi. These are the, and therefore, through that hole, we see the dark sky and that's the black spot. That's, that's, that's wonderful, uh, that's wonderful. No, one more minute, one Please, more minute, one more minute. Then Ram speaks. Ram says that that is the wish, the blackness, the poison. The moon and wish are brothers because they both came out to Samudra Manthan. They were both born the same way. And even though it is wish, it's so dear to moon that it has given him a place in his heart. And wish comes out of the rays of the moon when the moon shines. And it is like poison to all the lovers who are separated from their beloved. And again, the subconscious, he himself is separated from Sita. But even this is not the last word. Ram has spoken, it should be the last Hanuman word. Hanuman Ka. Yeah, Hanuman, Hanuman speak. Philip's favorite deity is Hanuman, it's not Ram. 
<laughs> so many people know the Ram Chalisa. Don't, they don't know any other part of the Ramayana. <laughs> Philip belongs to that tribe. He knows everything. Hanuman says that black spot in the moon is you, Ram, your image, the moon has placed in its own heart. And because you are dark, therefore the spot is dark. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Yatindra one last question, and then if we have time, we'll do a little bit of reading. Yatindra, you touched upon this. 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 You touched upon of the Manas and of course uh, Ram's uh, story uh, on the whole. There are only few temples that we know of, most people know of, outside of Ayodhya. But itne sare mandir vaha par hain. Aur in mandiron ki prathaye hain, ajeeb ajeeb se traditions hain. Aur uh, unme se folk aur classical ke, jo nritya aur song aur poetry ke jo traditions hain, wo un mandiron se jude huye hain. You are somebody who grew up in Ayodhya, you live in Ayodhya. But uh, you are also a poetry, literature, music critic in your own right. When uh, you are looking back at the poetry, song, temple traditions of Ayodhya, uh, what is it that, that stands out for you? बहुत बचपन की पुरानी आदे हैं. मुझे लगता है कि रामलीला देखना ही शुरू किया होगा क्योंकि मेरे घर में मेरे great grandfather ने रामलीला शुरू कराई थी 1875 में. Uh, वो ट्रस्ट बना था जब राज परिवार होता था मेरे घर के सामने ही भरत मिलाप और राजगद्दी प्रसंग होता था तो मुझे याद है 7-8 साल का रहा होगा uh, तो वो उसके कुछ चिन्ह हैं दिमाग में uh, लेकिन पूरी अयोध्या में ही वो ट्रेडिशन बरकरार है और तुलसीदास के साथ वो तमाम सारे भक्त कवि रसिक संप्रदाय के लोग क्योंकि राम अकेले वहां सिर्फ तुलसीदास के राम के तौर पे नहीं पूजे जाते वो युगलानंद शरण महाराज के भी राम हैं जब वो लक्ष्मण किला में क्योंकि वहां पर जो जानकी जी हैं वो डोली से मिथिला से लाई गई और उनको बहु के रूप में देखा गया तो वहां पे राजा धीराज राम है आप दशरथ महल में जाएंगे तो वहां रणरंग धीर राम है धनुषधारी राम है आप रत्न सिंहासन में जाएंगे तो वहां राजकुमार राजा के रूप में राम है आप वनवासियों के मंदिर में जाएंगे तो वहां वनवासी राम है आप कनक भवन में जाएंगे तो वहां दामाद के रूप में राम है पाहुन बने हुए हैं वहां रोज विवाह पंचमी के अलावा हर दिन विवाह के गाने गाए जाते हैं रंग महल में जाएंगे तो रंग महल राम जी के कुल देवता श्री रंग जी का मंदिर है और चारों भाई पालना में तो रात में पद का गाया जाता है सोते समय सो गए जुगल किशोर अवध किशोर महल विच नूपुर दाब चलो मोरी सखियों रुनक झुनक ना होए महल बीच इतने छोटे हैं कि अगर पायल बज गई तो राम जी जग जाएंगे ये रोज शैन आरती में गाया जाता है तो सो गए अवध किशोर महल बीच नूपुर दाब चलो मोरी सखियां रुनक झुनक ना होए महल बीच पहरेदार सजग होए रहियो आवा गमन ना होए महल बीच सो गए अवध किशोर महल बीच ये परंपरा है अयोध्या की तो उस तरह से राम देखे जाते हैं बहुत सारी परंपरा है वहां पे रसिकों की जो अपने को राम जी की साली मानते हैं वहां पर पूर्ण पुरुष परब्रह्म राम है तो सब स्त्री भाव से मौजूद है राम सखी मंदिर में राम जी को छोड़ के हनुमान जी लक्ष्मण जी भरत शत्रु सब स्त्री भाव से बैठे हैं चन्निया चोली पहने हुए हैं घूंघट काढ़े हुए हैं तो उस तरह से पूजा होती है तो वहां गाली सुनाई जाती है वह गाली गाली देते हुए तब जोनार होता है खाना होता है तो वो परंपरा है और सब तरह के लोग सब तरह के संप्रदायों के लोग रामानंदी रामानुजी बैरागी बीतरागी और रसिक संप्रदाय सब तरह की आराधना का क्रम चलता है तुलसीदास एक तुलसीदास एक बड़े टेक्स की तरह मौजूद है हम हर बार जब मानस की बात करते हैं अभी सर भी बात कर रहे थे तो हम ये भूल जाते हैं कि बहुत सारे और भी टेक्स्ट हैं तुलसीदास के जो पूरक पाठ की तरह राम जी के प्रसंग में लिए जाने चाहिए मानस अगर उनको कंप्लीट लगता तो मुझे लगता है बिना पत्रिका भी ना लिखते कवितावली भी ना लिखते गीतावली भी ना लिखते दोहावली भी ना लिखते और बरवेरा मैं जानकी मंगल रामलला ना छू बहुत लोग कहते हैं कि बहुत लिखा उन्होंने लेकिन ये नवनीत है 
लेकिन जब आप कवितावली के विवाह प्रसंग देखें उनका परिणय का प्रसंग देखें जिस तरह से राम का परछन हो रहा है आरती हो रही है वो रामचरित मानस से ज़्यादा कवितावली में भरतनाट्यम की परंपरा में ओडिसी की परंपरा में कुडियाट्यम की परंपरा में यक्षगान की परंपरा में तमाम दूसरे टेक्स्ट भी इस्तेमाल होते हैं और वो टेक्स इस्तेमाल होता है जिसका आधार रामचरित मानस है अध्यात्म रामायण जो वेदव्यास की परंपरा में आता है तो इतनी जगहों पे और राम जो एक रामानुजन वाली बात जो सर ने कही उसमें मैं जोड़ना चाहूँगा उनको ज़रूरत नहीं थी तुलसीदास को कि पच उन पाँच सौ साल बाद इस पर डिबेट करो और ढेर सारे कथा व्यास पैदा कर दो जो बहुत बड़ी बड़ी कथा करें और उस पर बड़ा इंटेलेक्चुअल स्कॉलरशिप की बात होने लगे वो तो ये कह ही रहे थे कि मैं स्वान्ता सुखाए लिख रहा हूँ भर ही निरंतर हो ही न पूरे तो जो ये कह रहा है कि जितना भी भर रहा हूँ जितनी भी कथा कर रहा हूँ वो पूरा ही नहीं होता वो कुछ ना कुछ छूट जाता है तो मुझे लगता है कि इसको समझने के लिए भी राम को समझना है तुलसीदास को समझना है अयोध्या को समझना है कि अब अवधपुरी ममपुरी सुहावनी जब वो कहते हैं तो आप आ करके देखिए कि वो किस तरह से सुहावनी है वो उसके बिल्डिंग से नहीं है वो उसके कुंडों से नहीं है वो उसके तीर्थ से नहीं है वहाँ पर मौजूद राम के होने से प्रयागदास की कथा सब लोग जानते होंगे एक मामा प्रयागदास हुए उनको एक स्वप्न आया एक लठैत थे उन्होंने उन्हें सपना आया कि सीता जी को राम जी ने बनवास दिया और मैं इनको ठीक कर दूंगा तो वो लाठी लेके निकल पड़े और उन्होंने कहा जहाँ राम मिलेंगे वहीं पिटाई करूँगा और और ढूंढ तेरे बेतहाशा अयोध्या आए उनका एक पद प्रचलित है तो नीम के नीचे खाट पड़ी है खाट के नीचे करवा प्रयागदास अलमस्ता सो है राम लला के सरवा नीम के नीचे खाट लगा के और एक लोटा लेके सोते थे और राम लला को अपना साला मानते थे और ऐसा कहते हैं कि प्रयागदास को राम के दर्शन हुए और जुगल जोड़ी के दर्शन हुए और उन्होंने बड़े संत बड़े पद लिखे तो जो अदर लैंग्वेजेस में जो कलेक्ल डायलेक्ट्स में राम कथा इतने ढंग से समाई हुई है मुझे लगता है उस सब के शीर्ष पे तुलसीदास बैठे हुए हैं और अयोध्या में उन परंपराओं का निर्वाह होता है लेकिन हर मंदिर की अलग परंपरा है जहाँ पे कोई भी किसी से कम नहीं है खुद विश्वभान कुंवरी का पद देख लें सिया दुलारी का पद देख लें प्रीति लता जी का देख लें युगनालंग शरण को देख लें तो इतनी चीज़ें गाई जाती हैं बिंदु जी महाराज को देख लें जो वृंदावन के थे जिन्होंने मोहन मोहिनी लिखा तो मुझे लगता है कि उनके टेक्स पे बहुत बात होनी चाहिए तमाम लोगों के जो टेक्स अभी दुनिया में ही नहीं है जो कभी बेलवेडियर प्रेस वेंकटेश्वर प्रेस या छोटे छोटे मंदिरों ने छापा दो आने चार आने कभी दुलारे लाल भार्गव प्रेस ने छापा अब मुझे लगता है वो टेक्स उपलब्ध भी नहीं है जो हैं वो वाचिक परंपरा में है या गाय बजाए जाने के क्रम में मौजूद है Thank you. Thank you so much. We are all out of time. I was hoping that we could do a reading, but the books are available. So, you uh, uh, you can buy the books yourself, and you can perhaps do a little bit of recitation for yourself. I think Philip will be signing books. Yatindra is also signing books. Yatindra is, of course, doing many other sessions as well today.